welcome everyone to our donor webcast on the topic a constitution in crisis i am charlie copeland the president of the intercollegiate studies institute and it is a privilege to welcome you to what promises to be a thoughtful and wide-ranging conversation if you are joining us here tonight uh, it's because you have been a loyal supporter of isi thank you for your faith in our mission to teach students the american tradition of liberty with our faculty network and student societies, ISI has a presence on 40% of America's college campuses, a larger reach than any other campus-based conservative educational organization. Your generosity has allowed us to produce principled leaders in business, law, academia, journalism, government, and many other areas of American life. For that, I am truly grateful to you. And I'm excited to offer this invitation-only program tonight as a way for you to engage with us in the battle of ideas. Tonight, we're fortunate to have with us, with us three panelists to discuss the current stresses on our constitution and on our social and political institutions. They're all highly regarded writers and thinkers. They're also all alums of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. It is an honor to welcome them. And with the technology issues that we're all facing today, if someone drops out or what have you, it's you know a Wi-Fi issue or something, and they'll come back in. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the world we live in today. But with that, our first panelist is Ross Douthat. Ross joined the New York Times as an op-ed columnist in 2009, becoming the youngest regular op-ed writer in the paper's history. He co-hosts the Times op-ed podcast, The Argument, and serves as film critic and National Review. Ross is the best-selling author of several books, including most recently, The Decadent Society. He was on an ISI student. He was an ISI student as an undergrad at Harvard. And if I read the New York Times, it is usually almost exclusively to read a column by Ross and not much else. But I'm excited to hear his thoughts tonight. Our next speaker will be Mark Thiessen. Mark writes a twice weekly column for the Washington Post and is a Fox News contributor. He is also a resident fellow with the American Enterprise Institute. Mark previously served as chief speechwriter to President George W. Bush and as Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. As an undergraduate at Vassar, he edited an ISI Collegiate Network student newspaper, and we are honored to have him as a member of ISI's Board of Trustees. Thank you for being here with us tonight, Mark. And the final panelist is Gary Gray. Gary serves as director of the McConnell Center for Political Leadership at the University of Louisville. He brings important perspective to our discussion as an award-winning political science teacher and expert on the U.S. presidency. Gary has been an ISI stalwart since his undergraduate days. He earned an ISI Weaver Fellow and Salvatore Fellowships as a graduate student. Later, he served as national director at ISI. He has published four books with ISI, and he frequently speaks at ISI conferences and ISI groups on campus. And we're thrilled to have him here tonight, even if they turned all the air conditioning off on campus. So before we begin, I would like to remind those attending the webcast that at any time you that at any time you can submit questions on the right side of the screen in the Q&A tab. I will pull out the top questions a little later in the program. And due to how the webcast system works, you won't see other people's questions. But trust me, they'll be posting questions. Uh, but I'll accumulate all of the questions during the presentation. And now to get us started, I would like to ask each of our panelists to share some thoughts on this pandemic and how it might be affecting presidential powers and our understanding of federalism and our government and the economy and the elections, as well as what's happened most recently in, uh, in the protests and riots, uh, largely in cities and, and, and larger towns across our country. Uh, so Ross, let me first turn it over to you. Um, well, first of all, can can you hear me? Am I coming through? Yes. Yep. All right. Excellent. I just I just want to make sure. Um, thanks so much for having me. Thanks to everyone for being here, whatever whatever being here means in the context of a uh, virtual seminar. Um, and it's certainly an interesting time to talk about issues of the Constitution and presidential powers. I guess my broad my broad view of what's happened in the pandemic is that it's been substantially different thus far. And certainly this was true before um, the protests began last week. So as of a week ago, I would have said that typically in moments of national crisis, you have a kind of consolidation 
of presidential power, um, an expansion usually, or a, or a sort of new claim, novel claims to presidential authority are put forward. Um, and that has contributed, I think, to the, you know, the growth in presidential power across various wars and crises and controversies in our history. In this case, um, in part, I think, because President Trump does not have necessarily a sort of consistent view of what strategy is best for handling whatever crises end up on his desk. You've had some sort of broad rhetorical claims of presidential power, but mostly the story of the pandemic has been a story of um, decentralized responses, of um, presidential uncertainty and state level, um, state level responses with the major players being governors from Ron DeSantis in Florida to Andrew Cuomo in New York to Gavin Newsom in California, the sort of the, the main sort of centers of consolidated power and consolidated responses um, have been in the states rather than Washington, D.C. And you could argue maybe that that suggests that the Trump White House is pursuing a sort of high minded federalism. Um, I don't actually think that's the case. Uh, as I suggested, I think it has more to do with the general chaos that tends to envelop this this White House and the, the sort of gulf between the president's desires to act and his capacity to use actually use the tools of office. Um, but that that I think is sort of that's my sort of quick take on the pandemic. The, obviously, the surge of protests has changed things to some extent. Um, I mean, any time that you have the president talking about invoking the Insurrection Act. Um, you have a situation where presidential power could be dramatically expanded. And, you know, in two days or two weeks, the picture may look radically different. At the moment, though, I think the general pattern has still held where the president has sort of made threatening noises about doing specific things, but his actual interventions have been confined to the blocks around um, the White House. And he, you know, he, he so as, as with the pandemic, he wants to sort of goad and goad and criticize governors for not taking him up on offers, you know, not not doing what he recommends. He hasn't wanted to claim, you know, the responsibility that would be involved, certainly in unilaterally um, sending in federal troops. So that's, you know, again, we, we'll see we'll see where this goes. But that's my take at the moment is that there's in the protests, as in the broader coronavirus crisis, there's a gap between presidential rhetoric, some of the fear that that rhetoric inspires among liberals, and what's actually happening on the ground. Okay. Um, with that, uh, let me uh, uh, turn it over to you, Gary. Uh, evidently, Mark uh, is having some technical difficulties. As, uh, Hopefully, we'll get him back. In DC. God knows, they might have uh, set uh, the, the, the internet backbone on fire, for crying out loud. Uh, so, Gary, please. Hey, Charlie, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Thanks uh, everyone at ISI for putting this on and all the other programs you do. Uh, I'm glad you uh, mentioned Charlie did not ask me to do a commercial, but he did mention that I started back when I was an undergraduate, which was a few years ago, 1986. I walked into my very first ISI debate uh, and my life was transformed uh, and has been transformed ever since. And and uh, so has uh, the lives of my students. So thank everybody out there for supporting uh, the vital work of ISI. I think I'm actually here because I'm sort of a one trick pony. Uh, I've I'm two tricks in my life, really. And one is C.S. Lewis. And I don't think we're going to talk about C.S. Lewis. So uh, so that that trick is out. So I think I'm really here to talk about the Electoral College, uh, which I've been uh, working on defending since I left ISI as national director, really, in, in 2000. So um, well, hopefully we'll come back to that, but it seems, as, as Charlie's introductory remarks hint, hint to here, uh, we might have some, some more pressing things to discuss uh, right now than the Electoral College. So hopefully we'll, hopefully we'll come back to that. I, I essentially agree with, uh, with, with Ross on, uh, on the presidential power question and where we are with the pandemic. Um, I think it has mostly been um, the exertions of presidential power have been mostly rhetorical. Um, and uh, some of those have been um, pushed back on, and um, and when such as when when President Trump declared that he had the ultimate authority to open state economies, whatever it was, you saw pushed back, and then that was dropped, and, and we went on with life, and uh, uh, it was fine. So now we have the Insurrection Act. We'll see what happens uh, in the in the coming uh, coming days. Uh, 
days with that. But I think if we look at this as any exertions of presidential power, they've been mostly rhetorical um, and not real, um, uh, no real steps forward, let's say, to grab grab power in any way. Um, and um, so anyway, I think that's uh, I think that's basically what Ross was getting at. I think one of the things that it brings uh, to me that it brings to the fore that we really need to have a conversation about, uh, and particularly us in the in the conservative world. And that is a, a problem that I think we have tended to lose the, the Constitution. And what I was thinking earlier today, I'm going to call the fog of ideology. And that is, we have tended to give a whole lot of lip service, some of us, to the Constitution, to the Founders' Constitution. We believe in these foundational principles. And then when push comes to shove and, let's say, federalism that we so, so, um, so much support, and a governor decides to make decisions we don't like, all of a sudden federalism is kind of uh, a little iffy. We're not sure we're, we're, all, we're totally for that. We might need a little bit of national direction here. Um, or, you know, in the Supreme Court, uh, we have been uh, fighting for original intent and judicial restraint, most of us, for a long time. I think that's the right, that's the right battle. But you can see when we lose in the court, all of a sudden sometimes we're, that restraint is not so sexy anymore. And... Um, in the same way with presidential power, we have uh, it, it declared uh, presidents as dictators for making decisions that, uh, that we don't like. And when the next president makes decisions we kind of like, we celebrate them for heroic leadership. I say that because I think this is a very serious problem um, in America today, this oscillation uh, in institutional partisanship. It's nothing terribly new in American history. But I think it's something that particularly conservatives need to be above. Uh, I don't I anticipate um, progressive living constitutional people will be all for that. That's sort of their mantra. But we should be above that. And I think it's a very serious issue. And it's something that uh, Alexis de Tocqueville warned us about uh, in Democracy in America. So I think that's one thing that, that, that comes out of this. We can have a conversation about that and should have a conversation about that and heading into the next election uh, as well. Uh, secondly, let me let me throw out. I see Mark's still not not with us yet, so I'm going to filibuster here for you for a while, uh, Charlie. Uh, second second point I thought is you know it just feels like, and I realize we have to read this through history, we have to know some history, uh, and know we've been through these things before, but it feels like boy things are just falling apart. They're just they're just blowing apart in uh, in in so many ways, and um, it really came to me this week as I was thinking about. The 1960 election, I made a joke right before we came on that I feel like Nixon in the 60 election. Somebody turned my air conditioner off, Bobby Kennedy out here, and, uh, and I'm sweating bullets. Um, but in the 1960 election, I was trying to teach uh, a group of high schoolers about the 1960 election. As I talked, it came more and more to my parent to me that they can't possibly understand the 1960 election, that world. Because we have, you know, if you think about all the Kurt cultural topsy-turvy uh, change here is Ross just wrote a book about this, about the, uh, the decadent society that comes after the space age, right, which is connected to the Kennedy kind of thing here. But we are, we are in a vastly different world of, uh, of divided uh, ideological divisions, cultural divisions, where we used to fight about politics and we used to fight about Republicans or Democrats. Now we don't, we have to fight about what is gender and what is, uh, uh, what, whether we, uh, we order black rifle coffee uh, or we go to Starbucks or whether we allow our kids to buy Nikes or whatever. We have to fight about everything. Everything has become political and everything has become politically divided right now in a way that I think is, is quite dangerous. Um, uh, long term, because the more we are divided at those levels, the less we have that might be the glue that sort of holds us together. And in divisions in the past, I think we had some glue that has allowed us to uh, to sort of bandage some of those wounds uh, and heal. So those are the, are the two things that I'm really thinking about uh, today and uh, your question about the pandemic and and the uh, the protests and riots and uh, injustice uh, and with the police force. Um, so let, let me just uh, uh, feed some questions out there. Um, you know, Ross, if, if on, a, on, a, on election day, 
Uh, there are 5 million mailed in ballots for New York City. Can the Department of Elections in New York handle any of that? I mean, is, is the infrastructure in place to actually count those ballots in a reasonable period of time? Um, I mean, I think it varies from state to state. And, you know, what we've seen in California over the last few election cycles is that you can take a very long time to get um, ballots counted. And this is, of course, an issue, you know, one of the things, as, as Gary knows well, one of the arguments in favor of the Electoral College, right, is that it avoids sort of, it, it avoids the spectacle of the national recount, right? If you have to have a, if you have to have a recount of the vote, at least you do it in two or three states rather than nationwide. And in a close election with, you know, with mail-in ballots, you can imagine um, some sort of cascading recount disaster overtaking the country. That being said, you know, lots of states have mail in have mail in voting. It's not, you know, it's it's not an impossible hurdle for states to overcome. And I mean, I think the question is more in it's more about the time frames and the, the capacities of states, I think, in certain ways than it is about whether whether it can be done. I mean, one of the lessons is not to bring everything back to the pandemic, but you know, one of the lessons of the last few months is that the United States lacks what political scientists right now call state capacity. We have a very big government, but not a very effective one. So that, you know, the CDC has one job and <laughs> it didn't do its job, you know? And so that, I mean, I think that problem hangs over all discussions of, you know, changing election rules and so on, that things that, that are theoretically possible, you wonder about their their practical effects. now. That being said, we we're pretty sure we know who's going to win the election in the state of New York. So if New York takes <laughs> if New York takes an extra month to count its ballots, I mean this is part of why it's less of an issue in California, right? California is increasingly a one-party state. If one of the swing states, well, we saw this, right? I mean, with Iowa, right, with the Iowa caucuses, when a state that actually matters can't count its ballots expeditiously, the whole you know the whole infrastructure of U.S. politics is set up for immediate immediate results and quick turnarounds. And nobody knows how to handle it when you go, in that case, days without a winner, um, and in this case, maybe weeks. Um, Gary, do you want to sort of weigh in on on that that impact as we... Yeah, I think, um, uh, Mark's right, we know who's going to win the uh, New York, we know who's going to win Kentucky, so those, those really aren't, uh, are, aren't an issue, but um, yeah, we're dealing with this in Kentucky, and I, I'm glad you brought the mail-in in, in bo votes, because I think... Um, yeah, we have to on, on our side of things. We have to we have to understand that mail-in voting is going to happen this election uh, almost assuredly. Um, we have to make it as as fair and as uh, free of fraud as possible. So we have to make sure you know we we do everything possible on that. But I was you know here in Kentucky, the the Secretary of State of Kentucky happens to be a former student of mine. And I was having a conversation with him um, recently and uh, on a podcast that I do and talking to him about this and asking him, put some pretty tough, tough questions to him because there's a lot of questions, a lot of people, in fact, on our side of things that are really up in arms about this, about mail-in voting. And he said, and he is, he's a Republican. He is one of the top election lawyers in the United States. Uh, he was the, um, the Republican Governors Association um, election lawyer for, uh, uh, for 10 years or something like that. Um, he said, look, let's look at the math. We've got, um, I think, in a, in a Kentucky, which is a relatively small state, I think he said they needed 1,500 polling places to do an in-person um, poll uh, election. Well, that means schools, that means nursing homes, that means churches, uh, right? If we have a, a second pandemic or, or, or uh, um, thing, how many of those are going to allow us to get in? How many are going to allow, you know, are going to be willing to take the risks? They're involved in it. Secondly, there's something like 3,700 volunteers. And if you guys vote, as I like to vote in person, I believe in that, um, you will know that 90% of the people that take your ballots are going to be in the uh, the age category to be the most at risk for this. So when we did in Kentucky, when they did call for, uh, for volunteers, uh, there were crickets. You know, there were cr crickets to work the polls this year for our primary. Our primary comes up in June this year. It was going to be in May, but we postponed it till the end of June. So anyway, that's something to think about when, as uh, I'm a Burkean, so when you see the inevitable writing on the wall here, we're gonna have some kind of mail-in elections this year, 
let's figure out how to make them how to make them fraud free as possible and uh, and and do it right. Well, the other, if I can just piggyback on that, I mean, the, the other point is, I think there's, I think there's a lot of conservative anxiety about, um, you know, sort of issues of of sort of expanding way, means of voting beyond election day, right? And some of that is understandable because you do, you know, there is obviously the risk of fraud, and you get these sort of vote har- ballot harvesting operations, um, which, including in California. Um, that I think do, you know, create sort of suspicions of like, if not actual fraud, at least sort of tacit fraud. At the same time, you know, you talk to a lot of Republican consultants going back the last 20 years, they say we do fine on mail-in voting. Uh, you know, that, that I mean, it, I mean, as, as Gary was saying, it's, Gary was mentioning that it's mostly seniors who work the polls. It's often going to be seniors doing mail-in voting who are at this moment, we'll see how the polls shape out, but a, a pretty heavily Republican constituency. And I think in general, you know, Republicans, this is also true of non-voters. You know, you get a lot of rhetoric from President Trump about how, you know, if you if you you know, if you have these these if you have mail in voting or these other things, Republicans will never win again. But actually, this is some of this is sort of a liberal myth, right, that non-voters are all are all Democrats in waiting. This was the whole theory of the Bernie Sanders campaign, right, that, you know, if you brought out the non-voters, they were all going to be socialists. And in fact, they brought out a bunch of non-voters and they all voted for Biden and defeated Bernie. And there's some, you know, there's some parallels to that to that nationwide outside of the Democratic primary. I mean, I my general view is that Republicans and conservatives should feel more comfortable than they are, um, at least right now, with, you know, with basically high voter turnout that they I mean, Trump drove turnout higher in a lot of places and and gained non-voters that Republicans hadn't successfully competed for in the past. Um, so I think there's I think there are opportunities for a more effective Republican Party in some of this stuff as well as as well as dangers. Well Mark, hey guys. Hey, what Mark, is? <laughs> we we were afraid they'd storm the palace. Uh, yeah, there it no. is. oh my gosh, I just restart my computer, restart the weather I then I had to restart the uh, uh, the uh, router, so I'm I'm back now. It looks okay. Uh, well, well, thank you for going through all of that. It it really is very appreciated. Well, uh, rather than so the presentation, I just jump in on the conversation that I started started heard, started heard. We're talking about mail mail and balloting. Uh, I did a column on this actually recently. Um, the it's interesting about mail and balloting is that uh, Ross is absolutely right that Republicans actually do do pretty well in mail-in balloting, uh, but it's never really been tried except for, five, there's only five states that have it in a very large uh, sum, so most, at least half the states have limited or no experience in mail-in balloting, so the thing uh, is it could cause, like, it would be conducting a massive experiment in mail-in balloting in one of the most contentious elections uh, in modern times, uh, and that's fraught with risk. Um, there was an MIT study uh, in uh, the 2018 uh, election. I think I've got the numbers here that there were there were 35.5 mail-in ballots requested, and of those, 7.6 million were not counted either because they didn't make it to the recipient, uh, the recipient didn't respond with the proper uh, with the, the signature didn't match, the recipient didn't send it back in, or some some sort of irregularity, and that's a failure rate of about 21 percent. Uh, that's in a, an election that wasn't particularly contentious, uh, at least or, or close. Um, and so if you imagine if we had massive use of mail in ballots and we had a failure rate of 21 percent uh, in the mail in ballots, there'd be people on either side uh, complaining uh, about the about the result. And that could sort of throw the whole election into contention. Um, and then you know, add to that that you're, you'd be. You'd be uh, doing this on a scale that was unprecedented, had never been tried before. Um, you would have, by definition, lots of states haven't purged their voter rolls. So normally, when you have mail-in balloting, um, somebody requests a mail-in ballot, right? I'm, I'm a registered voter. I'd like a mail-in ballot, please. What the Democrats are proposing is sending out mail-in ballots to every registered voter, uh, which will inevitably send millions of ballots out to wrong addresses, inactive voters, and so you would have circulating in the in the political ecosystem millions of ballots <laughs> and that's a that's a huge invitation to fraud um and certainly uh dangerous to do um and then the other thing that's really interesting about mail-in ballots is that 
the the data show, and you, there there have been studies of this in both Florida and in Georgia, that um, you know the Democrats really want to bring out Africa. They're worried about African American votes, uh, generally speaking, because Joe Biden is actually underperforming with African Americans. I know he beat everybody in the primaries with African American voters, but he is, I think. Overall, African-American support for Joe Biden is at about 79 percent compared to 88 percent for Hillary Clinton in 2016. And with younger African-American voters, his support is 68 percent, according to the last Washington Post ABC News poll, compared to like 86 percent for, for Hillary. So he's underperforming with African-American. They're counting on the Obama coalition to come out and reform behind Joe Biden uh, to, to, put, to put him over the top. And so they're very worried. One of the reasons why they're very worried about uh, why they want mail-in balloting is because they're worried that African-Americans have been hit harder by the pandemic than almost any other group. And so they're worried that African-Americans will stay home, not just out of a lack of enthusiasm for Joe Biden, but because of fear of the pandemic and fear of, uh, fear of uh, going to the polls. Um, and, what it, and so if they, they, if they have a massive use of uh, mail-in balloting for African-Americans, all the studies in Georgia and Florida uh, that have done this show that there's actually a higher percentage of ballots, not be, of, of African American ballots being rejected than than white ballots, um, and that could be for a number of reasons uh, that they're not filled in properly, that they're whatever it is, and so you could actually have the Democrats charging fraud <laughs> and demanding, uh, you know, that we have investigations under the Voting Rights Act. If you just look at already, they were talking about voter suppression in, in Georgia in the last election. That's why Stacey Abrams is really the legitimate governor of Georgia. We just haven't recognized her yet. Uh, you know, the, you could have actually, uh, you could have it be the Democrats uh, who are complaining about the irregularities with the, with mail-in ballots and saying that the election was stolen from them. So this whole mail-in ballot thing is very, very fraught and could lead to a very contentious result, I think, at the end of the election. Uh, so to, to um, segue a little bit on this um, and, and sort of get to, to perhaps the, the, the uh, sense of the, the populace and its, and its lack of faith in, in our governmental institutions, um, we've just had you know, three years of, of uh, uh, Russian probe. Uh, you've got uh, the attorney general coming in sort of a counter investigation. Uh, you came out of the Obama uh, era where especially conservatives felt that there were agencies within the federal government that have been weaponized against conservatives. Um, how do you how do you see this erosion in public trust in in governmental institutions uh, playing out? I think Charlie froze, or is that just me? Yeah, we, we, we may have, we've lost our moderator. I'm burning Wait, up and he's freezing. <laughs> pick it up. Somebody, somebody, wanted, we got enough of that question to uh, yeah. Some um, Mark, you want to take it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, look, I think that uh, the Russia investigation, the impeachment, it all it all bodes well for Trump. I mean, first of all, you know. There was an impeachment. <laughs> I mean, you know, since impeachment, we've had uh, we've had uh, the COVID uh, the pandemic, and then we've now we have these riots. It's like the impeachment seems like and Mueller seems like forever. They were having hearings the other day, um, you know, in there where uh, where they were brought, they brought it. Actually, it was, I think it's today Rosen, Rosenstein up to testify, and it seemed like you know they were rehashing ancient history. It was so old, but I think that I think that dramatically energizes Trump voters. Uh, that whole thing. I think that they feel like they tried to take him out. They tried to invalidate their votes. Um, and, you know, you see the uh, the enthusiasm uh, gap between Biden and uh, Trump is huge. Uh, again, uh, ABC News, Washington Post poll showed that only I think I don't have it in front of me, but I think only 24 percent of Biden voters are very enthusiastic about voting for him, which is the lowest uh, in 20 years in the Washington Post ABC News poll. Uh, Trump voters, 54 percent, are very enthusiastic about voting for him. So I think, uh, you know, it's the old saying, if you're going to take out the king, you better kill him. Uh, they didn't kill him. So, so sorry about that. I, I, I have the thunderstorm going through now. So uh... <laughs> as if 2020 couldn't get worse. It's, 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 like trying to launch, it's like trying to launch space uh, spacecraft out of Florida. Right. It's, it's, it's the <laughs> worst place to do that. I'd like to see it. But anyway, please, Ross, if you'd like to weigh in a little bit. Um, Why well, don't I mean, 
Yeah, without getting into sort of the the horse the horse race yeah. questions too much. I mean, I think I think you have. Yeah, I mean, I think the dynamic you have now has basically left impeachment as as something that's just going to be seen as a partisan tool going forward, um, which maybe was always inevitable. I mean, the reality is that you know you have. I I believe it was Mitt Romney the first the first president the first politician not of. Um, yeah. to, to vote to remove a president of his own party from office, right? So both the prior impeachments, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton, were both partisan affairs. Richard Nixon might not have been had it gotten to impeachment. But I think the, the Nixon model that so many people have sort of held in their minds for the last 40 years, where, you know, a, a, a set of wise men go to the president from both parties and sort of from his own party and say, you know, it's time to go. That that model does not depict how impeachment is going to be used in a polarized environment, and you know I th I think the I think what we're seeing is both a sort of normalization of that kind of tool, but also it's increasing. You know, it, it's increasingly clear that it's just a partisan tool. And if the Democrats had wanted to actually remove Trump, they needed to get you know fifty eight or fifty nine seats in the Senate. Um, instead of instead of the minority that they actually had. Um, so that's sort of a micro point. We can talk about the macro points about a lack of trust, but well, Gary can Gary can pick up there. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I, I probably got dropped due to uh, due to electrical surges or something. But, uh, you know, you've got the lack of trust in the legislative branch because of the weaponizing of the impeachment. On yeah. the flip side, during the Obama era, you had, especially conservatives felt that the IRS and some other entities have been weaponized from the executive branch. Democrats, I think, look at uh, the attorney general as, as weaponizing in, in the inverse. Yep. Uh, how does this, again, in this hyper-partisan environment where the, the voter feels that those political institutions are only there to go after the other side and they're all corrupt, how do we think that plays out? It's not necessarily the horse race piece of it or the impeachment. Um, I, I know it, it, it's... It, it's a tough answer, which is why we have you three. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a uh, it's it's a really important question, way beyond the, uh, the you know the horse race stuff, way beyond this presidency. Um, and I think it is. It goes back, you know. It, and I said in my opening opening remarks about the, the sort of the, the hyper I call it a hyper partisan uh, nature, the politicization of everything. So that includes our coffee, but we also includes every institution now and every aspect of. Uh, of the constitutional order, which is political, I get, and governmental at least, um, but it's become a weapons of, of partisanship and uh, an ideological warfare. I think that's really, uh, on the one hand, those of us that believe in limited government might celebrate that and say, well, this may finally rip off the mask of, uh, as Ross was saying earlier about the uh, about state capacity, is that states cannot do everything. And maybe we entrust too much power uh, to these institutions, and um, that that very well, and the inst these institutions, but the the size of, of the government. If we can't run, CDC can't run the plague uh, problem, uh, pandemic problem. Um, you know, we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Maybe we're chewing too much gum. Uh, maybe we need to cut back here. So that might be on on the good side. On the other side, you know, as a I think of myself as an institutionalist. Um, and just as our, our founders, I believe, were institutionalists. And that is you have to at some point have trust in the institutions that are going to last over time rather than just individual or parties of the moment or individuals of the moment. And so I do think long term, it looks like we're in a period of doing great damage to, the, to trust in what, what we're going to need as legitimate institutions at some point down the road. So if we look at, let's say, the CDC as being political and, and decision to wear a mask, being some kind of, of political warfare aimed at subduing the American people. Um, well, when it's some, maybe that's not necessary right now, but maybe it is six months from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, right? If we lose that kind of trust and we, and we distrust every expert that tells us anything, there's a reason to distrust experts, I get that, but if we <laughs> distrust Every House majority, if we distrust every Senate majority, if we distrust every uh, every uh, C, uh, uh, established in the CIA or the FBI, I mean, I don't know where we're left after all that. I think we're in a, we're in a very serious, precarious moment uh, coming if we can't salvage some kind of institutional trust 
somewhere along the way. I have no idea how to do that, except it's one of the many things that, that worries me. If I, if I could jump in on that, I, I agree with you that the institutions are important. And to the extent, to some extent, the institutions of work, impeachment, you know, you're not supposed to be able to impeach a president unless right. there's broad bipartisan support for it. And so they tried to do it without that and the system worked. Uh, right. You know, the, the Supreme Court, you know, one of the things about, you know, everybody was terrified that Donald Trump was going to usher in a new era of authoritarianism. You know, they forgot about the Constitution. They, there's checks and balances on 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 the president. And he's and uh, for most part, we've seen the checks and balances work. Uh, but, you know, the reason that institutions are being are being questioned, first of all, in the immediate sense, is because they're failing. Uh, you know, you look at like the distrust in the CDC, the CDC, you know, when, when the pandemic arrived from China, uh, we lost six weeks. You know, the reason we had to have a lockdown is because we weren't able to get testing up like in, in, in Hong Kong in Taiwan and all these other places, South Korea. They were able to get testing up very quickly. And what happened with the with the testing here was that first the FDA wouldn't approve private tests of it or private or academic labs from doing tests. They only approved the CDC and then the CDC blew it and, 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 and messed up the test. And it turned out that they, they investigated it was because of sloppy lab practices. They contaminated the test. So, you know, if we had had testing six weeks earlier, we might not have had the national lockdown that we did. So people look at our, our experts in our institutions and say they failed us. Uh, you know, the the federal government was, you know, I wrote a speech for President Bush in 2000, I think 2008 or 2005, laying out a national pandemic strategy, saying that we don't know when it's going to come, but at some point a pandemic is going to arrive. And that's why we need a national stockpile. Uh, we need to have ventilators stocked up. We need to have masks. We need to have all the things. And, you know, the the pandemic arrived and those weren't there. Now, we can debate whose fault that was. Uh, there's a lot of blame to go for in, in, in the previous administration uh, for, you know, they were supposed to uh, stockpile 40,000 ventilators under a program that Bush handed to them. They didn't, never did it. They didn't deliver a single ventilator. Uh, the, they, the stockpile of masks uh, was depleted in 2009 uh, with the bird flu and Congress and the Obama administration together didn't see it in their wisdom to replenish it. And so Americans look and say, We've been hearing for 15 years that there's a, that a pandemic was going to come, and when it finally comes, our the the establishment in Washington of both parties failed to prepare us. So you know, I, I think that this is, if anything, the distrust in institutions is well deserved. And then you, you we can get into the the FBI. You know, just the, just the whole TikTok of of how they conducted this investigation that we spent, you know, two years, 30 million dollars chasing a conspiracy theory of, of, of Trump-Russia collusion, a lot of Americans look at that and say, you know, they took it seriously. They were told the president of the United States was a traitor who had, you know, conspired with our enemy to undermine our democracy. And people, you know, really wanted to know and they trusted in Mueller to come to the truth. And he did in the end come to the truth. But they look back and say, why did why did we do that? Why did we spend that much that much money? Uh, and and that much time and tie up our entire country for two years with this with this. So you know the institutions have brought discredit upon themselves. And uh, you know if it's going to be rebuilt, it's going to have to be rebuilt because they're fixed. Right. I mean, I know I I basically agree with Mark. I think that public credibility follows public success or failure. And so if you look at polls on American trust in government, it was very high after we you know won. World War II, and it, until the Vietnam War went bad and Watergate and, you know, ur urban riots and so on. Um, and then you rebounded in the Reagan and Clinton eras because there was a perception that government was functioning again. And some of that just followed economic improvement, but it also followed things like, you know, the sense that we had won the first Gulf War, for instance, and changed public perceptions of our military's effectiveness and so on. And so we've had, you know, in the years leading up to Trump, you've had a succession of bipartisan failures. People think, um, you know, I know, I know Mark, Mark would argue the, the details, but people feel that the Iraq war was fought and lost, basically. Um, you had a financial crisis that offered lots of blame to go around for big institutions. Um, and then, you know, and you have like sort of quiet crises happening, like the opioid epidemic that nobody in Washington or on the coast sort of pays attention to until Donald Trump starts running for president and people are trying to figure out, you know, well, what's going on in all these communities that he's going to and have holding rallies in. 
Um, and, you know, and you could go on. And the pandemic is in certain ways the latest example. I think the challenge is that from the conservative side, what's happened on the conservative side is a understandable repudiation of sort of elites and expertise that hasn't sort of summoned up yet a capable group of outsiders who seem ready to restore confidence in government. And I think we're deep enough into the Trump era to say that it's not going to be Donald Trump who sort of, you know, plays Ronald Reagan, right? And, you know, even maybe Trump, maybe Trump wins the next election with another electoral college minority and Gary defends it, you know, and so on. But Donald Trump is not a realignment president. He's not a president who's building you a governing majority. He's at best sort of a firewall against liberalism. And, you know, in his biggest test, the government is not succeeding. So I think if you're, you know, especially if you're thinking about sort of younger conservatives and conservatives coming out of college, the kind of things that ISI is involved in, figuring out how you build capacity for an outsider movement to actually run the government effectively is probably the biggest question facing the right right now. Um, and I'm going to turn the light on behind me because my image is... <laughs> Let me agree with Ross on that uh, just a, a second. I think that there, there comes a point where, you know, as we... Uh, burn down. We've got to figure out how to build back, how to build up, and, and how do we build up? And I, I'm not. We're not there yet. We are still. Um, you not only you know has the institutions failed, and in a lot of ways, institutional actors um, misbehaved in very, very, uh, very negative ways. On the other hand, we're still in a period where we're even weaponizing that. So that's becoming the weapon that we're using. Um, is their misbehavior to make ourselves, you know, make our political points. So at some point, I think, you know, to Ross's point, at some point that tide needs to turn and we need to build some kind of a stat, some kind of foundation of a future establishment that will be both effective and in some way trusted um, by the American people and doing the kind of things the government should be doing, whatever that is, in the 21st century. I, I agree with a lot of what Ross said, but I, I disagree with one thing he said, which is that Trump isn't a realignment president. I think you actually have seen a major political realignment happening during the Trump era. So, you know, the Republican Party used to be uh, the party of uh, of the suburban, uh, you know, work, uh, suburban middle class American voters. Uh, the Democrats were the party of the elites. And what ha what happened was over a period of time is that the working class, who people Trump calls the forgotten Americans, were basically ignored by both parties. You know, we had two parties promoting globalization and free trade agreements, uh, which I'm a free trader. I, I I was supporting them, and the line was always, well, you know, there's no net job loss because yeah, so manufacturing jobs go to China, but uh, you know, we get these great tech jobs, and so our country's better off. And in Lordstown, Ohio, and other places, they were, it was a net job loss. Uh, people were, and and they were. They, we had the opioid crisis and all these things, and and there was you know dramatic. You know, before the pandemic of uh, of uh, COVID, there was a pandemic of deaths of despair. I think in 2018 we had 158 thousand deaths of despair, which are suicides. Uh, uh, drug overdoses or uh, alcoholic liver disease. Uh, uh, that. And so, you know, we had a whole community that was being ignored by the establishments of both parties. Um, and Trump rallied that community and brought them into the Republican Party. Um, and the Democrats, uh, uh, by contrast, have sort of picked up a lot of the suburban voters uh, in the 2018 election uh, that sort of were repelled a little bit by Donald Trump. And so I think you do have a realignment that I don't think gets changed back, just snaps back uh, at the end of the Trump era, when it, whether that's in you know a few months or four years. Uh, I think there's a fundamental realignment and the Republican Party uh, is now basically the party of the working class uh, in, in America. Um, and I will and the conservative movement, which is different than the Republican Party, is going to have to deal with that realignment. Uh, and how we respond to it. You know, we believe in free trade uh, as a principle. We're, 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 we're uh, libertarian on economics, but, you know, we also live in a democracy that has to respond to its people. So if, the, if, if a large segment of our population is saying free trade isn't working for us, we need to, if we want to save free trade, we got to figure out a way to advocate for free trade in a way that, you know, takes into account uh, the, the needs of, the, of, the, of that co coalition. So I think we're going to have to have a a way to met, deal as a movement with the reality of what Trump has realigned in the in the uh, in the Republican Party. 
And let me let me just quickly clarify that I agree with everything that Mark just said. Um, and <laughs> what I meant, I, I was probably using the term realignment poorly. What I meant was that Trump has not he has he has not he has not created a new a clear new majority for the Republican Party. He has changed the composition of the Republican Party in exactly the way that Mark describes. But that trade right now, it gave the GOP a better performance in the Electoral College um, last time around. But it still left the party, you know, with a lower share of uh, the popular vote, which it's had in most of the last few elections. So to get to he's, you know, any any new Republican majority, I agree with Mark, will be built on some kind of working class foundation. Um, but that new majority that can actually govern the country and not just sort of be defensive, as I think Trump mostly has been, um, is still it awaits another Republican leader, I think. Mm-hmm. So to, to that point a little bit, uh, you know, ISI has always sort of taken its position as an educational institution on college campus and as a as a fusionist role. And that is that, that we don't want to take sides with religious conservatives or fiscal conservatives or libertarians or, you know, we want to have everybody have that dialogue because it's through that, you know, productive dialogue uh, amongst bright, intellectually cu- curious conservative thinkers that the best ideas coming out of the conservative movement happen. And yet today we do have uh, some brilliant conservative thinkers who in some ways have become irrational anti-Trumpers. Uh, and granted, there's plenty about Trump to maybe make you irrational about, but uh, one would hope that our, our rational and reasonable streaks and logos would would help there. Uh, how do How do you see the conservative movement itself Facing what what I think you all sort of agreed in one way or another is there 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 is a, a, a significant constitutional concern going on right now in in the effectiveness of government and faith in government and our institutions and this kind of thing and uh, how does the conservative movement move forward without an internecine battle that a disruptor like a Donald Trump uh, initiates from speaking from the academy i guess here <laughs> where they've turned my air conditioning off to punish me for my unorth or heterodox thoughts Maybe the institutions don't work <laughs> <laughs> yet another one failed us um look i think i think one of the things that we have to do it seems to me is we've got to get beyond donald trump donald trump as i agree with mario it was a realigning president i mean i, I i'm from western pennsylvania so there has been nowhere that I know of that has realigned more than Western Pennsylvania has. Everybody I grew up in, grew up with in the 1980s were Union Democrats that are now all rabid right wing uh, Trump uh, Republicans. That is that is transformed. Uh, it's really quite stunning. But I think Trump is loses just as many or probably I would bet in the next couple of years, more people to our cause than he than he brings to our cause. We're going to get some voters in our cause, but in um, with his uh, he he will not um, his presidency will not wear well. Let's put it that way. And I think if he wins a second term, uh, it's not going to be a heyday for conservatism. It's going to be a serious problem for conservatism because I don't think Donald Trump intellectually knows what he is as a conservative. I think he governs as in a lot of ways as a conservative. Um, but we are going to be we have to have a conversation that says, let's not talk about Donald Trump. Let's talk about foundational ideas. Let's talk about principles. Let's talk about uh, the, Russell Kirk would say the permanent things. Let's talk about Burke and whatever and apply them to the moments of the day rather than get in, which I think has been a serious, serious problem with us on the right right now, as it just has on the left, getting in this cult of personality where it's all about right now it's Donald Trump in the 80s it was Ronald Reagan we've got to found, uh, think about foundational questions foundational ideas and build a movement on um, on that and not on personalities um did we lose is mark frozen or am i just for me well, I'm not here. I was just for what i said he's frozen <laughs> <laughs> he's there to jump in <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead and jump in, Ross. Um, so yeah, I, I so I think just to just to take. Well, let me try and merge the 
Charlie and Gary's points. I mean, I think, you know, I was not for Trump in 2016. So I was part of whatever never Trump is. I was part of it. Um, but I think that there's been a clear kind of internal schism in never Trump since then that I think goes to Gary's point about first principles, where people who had people who had first principles that sort of kept them permanently estranged from liberalism um, have remained conservative with, you know, without being without becoming necessarily extremely pro Trump have sort of remained clearly within the conservative fold. And then there were other figures who were sort of on the right of center for more contingent reasons who have gone from sort of never Trump to never conservatism. So I'm thinking more, of, you know, figures like a Max Boot um, or a Jennifer Rubin, some of my fellow, you know, fellow pundits. Um, so that I think is interesting and speaks to like, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I wasn't for Trump. I don't think he's doing a good job, but I'm not going to end up as a liberal because of it. But some people have. And that is, I think, revealing of how these sort of underlying principles work themselves out in yeah. periods of stress. Um, I would also say that, though, that, you know, the, the case for Trump, um, the intellectual case, not the political case, is that he has opened up some debates that conservative intellectuals and policymakers really need to have. Um, and I think the for a, an institution like ISI that's interested in sort of being a big tent, it's not a case where ISI needs to abandon, you know, fusionism or abandon its commitment to have both libertarians and social conservatives. It's, it's more than it needs to recognize that the tent is bigger and weirder and baggier right now than it's been than it was, you know, when I was when I was in college. And instead of having, you know, the three legged stool or the two groups you have like six or seven different groups and factions sort of struggling to define what what being on the right means after Trump. And that's a really interesting and important argument. It's happening in, you know, it's happening in the journals. It's happening in modern age. It's happening in upstarts like American Affairs. It's happening in National Review. And that's those are the kind of arguments that are, that's where sort of the intellectual first principles meet what the post Trump political reality and that's what's incredibly valuable, I think, for ISI to do that, you know, without mentioning any specifics, I think some other campus conservative organizations are less interested in maybe having those kind of debates. Yeah, I would. I was very much I was very close to you, Ross, during during the uh, last election. Uh, I literally walking into the voting booth. I was not sure that I could actually pull pull the lever and vote for Trump, though I ended up doing it. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, in retrospect, I'm really glad I did. Um, it, and I, I have the same. Uh, and part of the reason I wasn't sure I wanted to vote for Trump is because I really didn't believe he would govern as a conservative. I thought that he wasn't particularly principled. I thought that he was a New Yorker. I thought he'd get in bed with Chuck Schumer uh, and had cut deals and do all sorts of things that were anti-conservative. And perhaps it's pure not it's purely because the Democrats were so aghast at Trump and pushed him into the arms of the right. He's governed as one of the, you know, there's, there's policies here and there I disagree with. Um, you know, I do a every year, my annual end of the year column, I do the 10 best things Trump did and the 10 worst things Trump did. So I'm trying to be objective as to where uh, to his both his strengths and his flaws. But if you had told me in 2015 without naming the candidate, you know, a candidate behind a behind a uh, a uh, screen, we're going to stop Hillary Clinton from getting elected. We are going to pass fundamental tax reform for the first time in 30 years. That's a, that's a, that's supply side tax reform. We're going to put two conservative justices on the Supreme Court. We are going to uh, unleash. We're going to have massive regulatory reform. I'm a, I'm a Kemp conservative, so I would. So I would. We're going to do criminal justice reform. We're going to pass enterprise zones uh, in the inner city. Uh, and I could go on and we're, oh, and oh, by the way, we're going to defund Planned Parenthood and have uh, probably the most pro-life administration uh, in in your lifetime. And I didn't know who it was. And I asked any conservative, including the never Trumpers, I said, will you sign up for that? They'd all say, sure, absolutely. It's it's only it's, so it's, you know, Trump has governed in, you know, there are exceptions to this on trade and where there's been some rethinking about globalization and free trade uh, that I think we need that that has needs some intellectual discussion and a little bit of humility on on the part of us who are free traders to recognize uh, that we've been not listening to people uh, about the effects of it. But overall, you know, and then, oh, by the way, the Democratic Party is going to embrace democratic socialism. 
Um, and Barack Obama is going to look like a right wing radical compared to, uh, you know, the, the majority of the candidates that are going to run in 2020. Um, you know, I'm sorry, but it's 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 you know uh, the 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 choice going forward for for the conservative movement is pretty clear. Um, it, it, the uh, so uh, I, and you know we have to we we. We were not, I, particularly at ISI, we're not political activists. We're 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 thoughtful. We're intellectual. We're trying to understand these issues. Um, but but you know the the agenda that we have to rally around as a movement, it's been implemented in ways. I mean, there's things that Trump did in office that you know George W. Bush, who I love and we thought was a great president, uh, would, wouldn't have done, like in pro-life decisions. You know, Donald Trump went to the pro-life pro-life march. I mean. Ronald Reagan didn't do that. George W. Bush didn't do that. That sends a huge sim- signal uh, to the country. And he j- just the Supreme Court by itself, uh, it, it, you know, the idea that we would have replaced Scalia with a with a liberal uh, liberal Democrat. And then add, they probably would have added two more seats uh, during this term. Uh, you would have a left wing majority on the Supreme Court for the next you know 20 years for a generation that would have eroded fundamental freedoms that we are fighting for at uh, ISI. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, my hesitation that I had in 2016 is gone. Let me, uh, can I pick up on, on Mark's point? Cause I think it's, um, this is not to disagree with what, what Mark just said, but it's to use it to make, make my point again, is I think, I think Mark's, uh, what he just said is, is, uh, points to my point, And that is how he switched from being questionable Trump. I don't know to being, uh, wherever he is right now, uh, with, with Trump is, um, we don't know what, what we, when we put, and this is a problem I think the movement is really doing right now, is we, just like we did in the 1980s, is we put so, I love Ronald Reagan for crying out loud, loved him, but we put so much stock, every, everything Trump does is, is the def, new definition of conservatism. And almost nobody actually that's really a conservative still fights back on it um, in any seri- really serious way. None of our politicians are, our politicians are all cowed uh, on the right uh, to whatever Trump says at the moment. The danger is what it, in that next, what if he's not Mark in the next, it, when, once he's liberated from running for reelection, mm-hmm. what is the Donald Trump of the second term? I really don't know. I can't honestly say uh, whether it is. No. I'm not sure he's going to move to the left, but no, I think no, he might no, move no, so no, far no. to the right or so far in some direction, wherever he is, uh, that it's going to end up alienating us and throwing the real serious conservatism that is has been a tradition, has been a evolving tradition, but has been a tradition from Burke, whatever, till uh, uh, to today. It's going to throw it off with this cult of personality again. So I just, I am just, you know, I'm sort of over uh, conversations <laughs> about Trump um, and conservatism. Would rather t- let's talk about foundations of conservatism and then say, oh, by the way, Trump is is conservative in that way. Awesome sauce. Uh, and then we can talk about other things and we can say, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not going to be a Trumpian on his his rhetoric, let's say, his, his Twitter feed, whatever it is. Um, I think that we need to have a smarter sort of uh, dialogue and um, uh, about that in the in the in the movement. Can I make one point in, in, in response to that, which is, you know, Ross was talking about the different types of never Trump and that there's some people who probably, you know, probably weren't really con- all that conservative to begin with. If you can become a liberal because of Trump, then you probably weren't a conservative to be, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but that's how I would say it. Um, I don't understand what's so hard about just being what you were the day before the election in terms of philosophy. Like, you know, I, I do my column with the 10, be- 10 worst things that Trump did when he wanted to invite the Taliban to, uh, to Camp David. I said it was the most shameful thing an American president done in my lifetime. Um, and when he puts a great Supreme Court justice on the Supreme Court, I say he, you know, and, or goes to the pro-life rally, I say he's the most pro-life president in my lifetime. I don't understand what's so hard about being the person you were before the election today with the possibility of having some humility to say, well, he saw some things that I didn't see and I maybe need to reassess where I am on 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 pure, unadulterated free trade. Yeah, that There seems to be, at least on the right, an inability to do those two things at the same time with a lot of people. People are so the people who hate Trump are so consumed with hatred that they they would have been willing to let Bernie Sanders become president. You know, and I'm not willing to do that. I can, what we can see his flaws as a person, and we can still say what well, if you're doing X, that's not conservative, and we as conservatives are opposed to that. We should be able to do that uh, without 
you know, we, we don't have to drink the Kool-Aid and become a part of a cult of personality uh, in order to support the president when he does the right thing and oppose him when he does the wrong thing, just like we would have, you know, just like we did during, some people did during George W. Bush's presidency. I don't understand why this is so hard for people. So, so let me, uh, let me segue since we don't want to talk about Trump. Uh, <laughs> just I do, everybody else does. <laughs> let's, uh, let's segue to, to the court. Uh, a little bit here. So the pandemic has forced, uh, and 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 I think in many ways at the beginning of it, justifiably so, because we had no data into some some uh, pretty significant lockdowns. And then as more data came available, things loosened up or what have you. Uh, and many governors were sort of flying by the seat of their pants. And they'd shut down this, but let this go on, and so on and so forth. And uh, and let's look at religious liberty. So um, there are cases all the way to today that uh, that. Uh, even the court has weighed in and said, well, you know, um, we're not going to get in the middle of that uh, where where uh, religious institutions are, are being held to a different standard. Uh, how, how do we respond to that? And what are your thoughts on that? Gary, you want to start? Well, I think, oh, go ahead. I, think the, I, I mean, I was going to say, I think the the landscape has shifted with um, with the protests. Um, because up until up until this point, there was an argument, you know, I, I think a reasonable argument and that, um, you know, that that there was sort of, you know, in, in a comprehensive public health emergency, it's reasonable for the state to ask churches to, you know, pursue the same policies that other public gatherings do and so on. Um, and it isn't discrimination against religion as long as you're holding churches to the same standard that you're holding other public gatherings and so on. Over the last week or so, it's become clear that, you know, major American cities are just going to have mass protests with, you know, barely, barely any concern for social distancing. And I think that that completely changes the religious liberty argument. I think that if it is acceptable for, you know, tens of thousands of people to march in the street to protest racism, then it becomes very hard for the government, for governments that are allowing that. And obviously this isn't happening in every single place. But governments that are allowing that to then stand up in court and say they aren't disfavoring religious institutions if they aren't allowing them to have 50 people there for mass. So I think there's been I think the the protests have shifted the logic of that debate, even relative to the. To the Supreme Court ruling where John Roberts sort of cited liberals to say this wasn't disfavoring religion, I think I, I'm not sure, but I think that. That ruling would look a little bit different if it was in a if it was on something that was in a state that had the kind of protest we're seeing now. Charlie, I just want to tell you the power of ISI because through this webinar, my complaining, sweating to death, somebody turned the air on. So I think one of your donors has called the university. So thank you, whoever did that. I appreciate it. Uh, I think I think Ross is right on that. It is uh, I mean, it's, it's stunning uh, how fast this has changed. All of a sudden, so many of these governors are not concerned that much anymore that we are social distancing. Uh, as long as you call it a protest, you're you know, there's no there's no complaint about it, um, which is fascinating. But um, on the question of religious liberty, and I, and I wrote a column against my own governor from Kentucky um, against uh, against him and his decision to. Uh, you know, to ban church uh, church gatherings, and to, on Easter Sunday, threatened to send out uh, the state police to take um, uh, to take uh, license plate numbers from people that were sitting in their parking lot. Right. So I wrote against that at uh, as, as just bad policy, and it is um, uh, you know <laughs> in violation of religious freedom um, and assembly. However. Let's we also this is a good moment where we can talk about um, institutional partisanship here and ideological thinking on these. I'm not a constitutional law um, scholar, uh, professor, and that's probably why I should be talking about it, because so many of them should not be talking about it, frankly. <laughs> but um, but we have you know, how did we get the First Amendment to apply to Kentucky? That's not a, that's not actually a conservative conservative thing, right? This is selective incorporation. We've allowed the Supreme Court to take the Bill of Rights and apply it to the states selectively, not all of them all at once, selectively over time. Uh, I used to love to point out how the Second Amendment was never incorporated, but now, now it has been. But the bottom line is we could have a conversation about that, which almost no one is. We always want to just pound, we want to assume we have to fight and use the court to promote our agenda of, uh, of religious freedom. 
I say potentially is let's look at the court and should the court have the power to rule on state decisions um, relate, you know, use the, the federal constitution to relate to the states. I don't think that's that's not our founders constitution. Uh, it's evolved over time, 14th Amendment after the Civil War and that kind of thing. But it's it's the 20th century liberal courts that have done that. Um, and uh, so I think that's a, just a good example is uh, I'm not sure where I would have come down on it. Um, but we should have that kind of a conversation is regardless of what we think about the al- policy outcome we want, which institution should be making the decisions? Mark, you want to weigh in? Um, yeah, I mean, one, just one side note on what Ross was talking about with the with the protests. Uh, you know, there was a if we, if we want to, like, uh, understand the growing distrust of experts and institutions. There was a hundred a hundred uh, infectious disease experts wrote a letter saying it's OK to go to the protests because racism is as dangerous a virus as COVID. So yeah, uh, the 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 more more fodder for the uh, for the uh, distrust of experts. Um, you know, I I hate to inject politics again, but this is you know this is again stakes that we're having right now in terms of the court. The the, the truth is that what's happening in the Supreme Court is that we have two different visions of how the Supreme Court should function as an institution. For the left, it's a, it's a uh, you know it's an outcome based uh, approach. Uh, that they 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 see the court as a vehicle by which they can push through policies uh, that uh, that they might not be able to get through the de- the democratic legislative and, and executive uh, through the through the legislative process. And so you know you if you just go look back at the history of Supreme Court appointments going back to you know Ronald Reagan, Democrats are batting a thousand. In terms of reliability, on I mean, not, and then you know, I know they agree on most things, but not on, on not everything's controversial. But you know, what can you name in the last you know twenty or thirty years a major case in which uh, a liberal de- a liberal appointed judge did what John Roberts did in that in that case the other day? There's not very many examples of it. There might be a few, but I don't know a lot about them. You know, re- Republicans when they and their appointments were batting you know five hundred maybe in terms of reliability. Uh, half of you know Ronald Reagan's uh, picks went to, you know uh, went south, uh, and even here with with George W. Bush, who had pro- previously been probably the most uh, appointed the most conservative justices, John Roberts has become, uh, you know, he's gone from being the, uh, the 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 umpire who doesn't who just calls balls and strikes to sort of rewriting Obamacare. Um, so you know we don't do a very good job of of vetting our our Supreme Court picks in large part because we don't we don't treat it the way the left does, which is we need you to pass a certain litmus test and then we'll put you on the Supreme Court and then you just reliably deliver that. Whereas we, 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 because we're, you know, Federalist Society, you know, strict constructionist uh, uh, philosophy, we just want to make sure, well, you have the right philosophy and we don't want to, and we also don't want you to have a much of a record when we put you up because uh, then we don't want to have anything that people can pick away. And so we don't know what we're getting. And the last two picks, you know, the, the 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 between Kavanaugh and and you know, talk about pirate power of ISI, Gorsuch, uh, you know, we've seem to be so far the most reliable uh, reliable conservatives. It's a, it's an early it's it's still early in their tenures. Most reliable conservatives uh, that have been appointed to the Supreme Court in the last several decades. I throw Sam Alito, another ISI alum, into that uh, mix of uh, you reliable. Uh... You know, his philosophy is different than Neil Gorsuch's. There's no doubt about it. They, they don't always agree, but uh, but they, they they do come from first principles to get to, to Gary's comment. Um, do you see any uh, any uh, any uh, major constitutional questions come before the court that uh, that that may be dicey in some way, shape, or form over the next I don't know six months? I mean, there, are there issues because of the riots or the pandemic or or the the the, the federal investigation and the FBI lying to the FISA courts or any of this kind of stuff. I mean, is, is, is there anything percolating up that that you see that that may become a, a constitutional issue that could spur problems? I mean, I don't follow the courts close enough to uh, to immediately have one in mind. Go ahead, yeah. Ross. Yeah. There's, a, there's certainly well, a, I mean, there's a, a case of that are percolating. Ross, you want to go ahead? 
Uh, sure. I yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a certain set that we know are already percolating cases on abortion, the little sisters of the poor, Trump's tax returns, and so on. I think that to maybe more directly to your question, I think a lot depends on what happens with protests and COVID, with both of which raise a lot of important constitutional questions. And this one case, this one issue on religious liberty was just sort of, you know, one example of the tangle of questions that are that are raised by these issues, uh, by these by these crises, right? So, I mean, we're again, we're having a debate about the proper boundaries of the Insurrection Act. That's obviously something that the Supreme Court could be brought in to adjudicate at some point. And similarly, you know, the constitutionality of various federally mandated or state mandated public health policies is something that in certain cases hasn't ever been litigated before because we haven't had this kind of sustained governmental response. But so, yeah, I don't have like a specific example, but those are obviously both areas that could generate some quick unexpected and important Supreme Court decisions. Certainly the uh, the case that will probably royal the court the most will be uh, Trump v. Biden. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> I think one of the things, if I could pick up just, uh, just on John Roberts is, I think Roberts is interesting, um, you know, uh, interesting only because it seems to me he's decided he is going to play the role of institutional protector and so if that means he finds a loophole to call a mandate a tax um, and it protects, he in his mind, protects the institution of the court from becoming, you know, being alienated from one of the political sides. I think he seems to be playing that game in that in that middle. Um, so much more of a politician than a uh, than what I think most of us that are originalists would want our, our judges to be our justices to be, I should say. But there's also just question of what, you know, what uh, I think Gary was making a version of this point, like what the what do conservatives want the court to do? And there's always been a tension between sort of between limits, you know, sort of judicial modesty and um, a sort of, you know, a sort of activist originalism. Right. And and that, you know, that goes back. There were debates between Antonin Scalia and uh, Richard Epstein, I believe, about this in the 1980s. Um, and over time, you know, when these debates started, conservatism was very strong politically and very weak in the courts. And so it was not surprising that conservatives tended to favor judicial modesty and sort of, you know, and expansive right, understandings right. of what legislators can do. And at this point, things have not completely reversed, but somewhat reversed, right? where, you know, the, the um, conservatism, I think, is in certain ways weaker in the country as a whole than it was. Certainly social conservatism is than at certain points in the past. But it has, you know, a certain kind of control of the Supreme Court. So in certain ways, it asks more of justices than it might have 30 years ago. I mean, I, I'm not sure that, you know, it, something like the Obamacare debate would have played out exactly the same way um, decades, decades earlier. And there are ways in which, you know, some of what Roberts is doing is sort of aiming for sort of judicial modesty, which is then in tension with um, various schools of sort of more activist originalism on on the right. I mean, even in this, even in the religious liberty case, he's deferring to, he's deferring, he's being a federalist in certain ways. He's deferring to, de deferring to state power. Um, and that's, that's, I think, just sort of a tension that was in there from the beginning of the sort of Federalist Society, conservative judicial revolution era. One, uh, I'd be interested in what you guys think about this, especially uh, Gary, because you uh, mentioned, you talked about Roberts' philosophy, is whether Roberts would be a different chief justice <coughs> in a 5-4 court than in a 6-3 uh, court or, uh, you know, or, or where, where there's a greater conservative majority and he's not trying to he's not forced to balance uh, so much, uh, you know, because we're the next president, whoever that is, is going to probably get uh, to could very well get two Supreme Court picks. Um, and uh, if it's a Republican who picks those, uh, the balance of the court will be dramatically shaped. We'll have moved the court to the right for the first time in a very long time. Um, and I wonder whether Roberts would be a different chief justice. Uh, in those circumstances than he is right now, where he's trying to 
balance uh, the liberal, almost co-equal liberal blocks and be the swing vote there? I think that's a great question. I don't, I don't know the answer I think, to it. I think it's a great question. I think a way to uh, pick at it, though, is I think um, if you asked, is he just was he just appointed, um, which I, I think if I remember correctly, he was just going to be a, a justice, uh, associate justice. Um, right. And then uh, he, he was Bush elevated him to uh, to rank list. Um, the yep. chief, I think he would have been my guess is it's just my gut feeling. I don't I don't know this. I've not made a study of his uh, of his work or his philosophy, but is is he would have been a different associate justice than he is chief yeah. justice because i do think he feels like he is in that role of that that institutional protector role somewhat like john marshall was in the institutional grower mole uh role of the in the early courts and and that's kind of a, of a political role so if you if you gave him a bigger majority um i don't know my gut tells me he would still try to shave shave the decisions in a way that they didn't move too fast to the right, let's say, um, at least uh, in order to, uh, to sort of protect the courts. Uh, that's just my my total guess there. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think that I think that's plausible. I mean, I think I think it, you know, not, uh, there's sorry, I've got an echo. I, I think. I mean, generally, and this is this is sort of the big picture point that I would make about the larger questions we're talking about. Like, we have very clearly evolved um, in practice, if not in law, as a society towards a dynamic where policymaking is conducted through negotiations between the executive branch and the judicial branch, and the legislature is is sort of you know abdicates, doesn't want to do things, and you know becomes increasingly vestigial. And so, it's not surprising in that dynamic that a figure like Roberts, who has, you know, strong political antennae, would feel all kinds of cross pressures that a chief justice in a country where the legislature was more robust and actually legislated might not feel like, you know, the courts and the presidency together are, you know, are they're more than they're more than two of the three branches right now. They're more like three quarters of the branches, I would say. And that's that's the big shift of the last 30 or 40 years, I think. Hmm. Is that shift, and, and I'd see whether the, the you know, Gary or Mike, uh, Mark uh, agree or have a different take or whatever is, I mean, is, is that shift, the, the, the abdication of the legislative branch, uh, is that underlying the, 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 the majority of our constitutional crisis or is it just a, a whole host of Lots of things from Twitter on up. I just reviewed a uh, for Law and Liberty. I just reviewed a book called The Living Presidency, um, and um, and I think uh, the author's name escapes me right now, um, but he's a law professor, so I guess we won't hold that against him at University of Virginia. Uh, but his um, it, uh, what he does, I think, is a nice a nice way of putting it. Is, is we often think of the quick answer is yeah, the legislature defers too much to the executive. Um, or the nature of war has changed, something. It, um, but it's really a whole complex, I think. And, uh, and I think it's really worth tearing, I, mean, I won't tear it all apart, but yeah, do the legislature, are they, do they not want to take tough calls? Yes, that's right. Uh, do they, uh, they might cost them a re-election? Um, do, they, um, do they tend to uh, fall in line with every uh, president that is their own president? And so support every exertion of presidential power? Yes, they do. Uh, it's a serious institutional problem uh, for, for members of Congress. Um, is, do the American people seem perfectly fine uh, letting the bureaucracy make the decisions um, or trusting the meaning of the Constitution to the courts? Um, and, um, we seem, we seem to have been okay with that. I'm not okay with any of that, but we seem to be okay with that. And we can go on, but there's, I think it's a whole complex, but I think it's a core issue that we really need to start thinking about because as Ross points out, we are, you know, our system, all the stuff we tell kids in, in school of the tripartite system, checks and balances is so much rubbish, uh, at this point. Uh, and so, and not completely, but in so many ways, it just doesn't function like Madison intended to function. Read Federalist 51, it just doesn't function that way. And that's part of all those reasons. But I'll say my big dig is political parties. Political parties have destroyed the checks and balance system. 
Um, and it's exactly what Woodrow Wilson wanted it to do, with, uh, aligned with popular opinion. The progressives wanted, and they've got their way. I would just uh, throw in one one more point on it. In addition to what Ross said about the abdication of the legislative branch, so you've had a new phenomenon in, in recent years, uh, which is the legislative branch actually threatening the court. You had <coughs> two cases in the last year in which a number of uh, Democratic senators have come together and basically told the court, if you don't rule in a certain way or uh, that we're, we, we will restructure you. Um, and, you know, they, they literally Sheldon Whitehouse on the case, it was a gun case in New York, said if the court takes up this case, uh, your credibility will be destroyed and uh, we will have to look seriously at the phrase restructuring the court. What they mean is court packing. So you actually have a situation where, you know, talk about a constitutional crisis where you have the, the legislative branch basically send members of the minority in the Senate saying if we take the majority, uh, we are going to uh, punish you for not voting the right way. I, I think that's a fundamental threat to our uh, tripartite system of government. Before Ross jumps in, let me say, is I think the difference is on that is that's not an institutional pushback, at least yet it could be, but it's individuals throwing out, you know, ideas uh, that are 90% of the chance not going to happen, 99% uh, whatever. But, um, but what we really need is institutional pushback. Um, you know, Madison says ambition to counteract ambition. Members of Congress do no longer have a real ambition, at least members of the party that is aligned with either the president or the courts, no longer have the, the, the ambition to push back against those other institutions. Ross, any thoughts there? Well, I mean, I, I guess I think I, I agree with Mark that it's incredibly inappropriate um, and reckless for senators to make those kind of threats, as, you know, as Schumer did in, in a speech recently. But it also, I think, in a weird way, reflects the kind of legislative impotence that I'm talking about. It's like the only way you can imagine yeah. dramatic change is get, you know, sort of either bullying or appealing to the mm -hmm. Supreme Court to do what you want. And then if you lose the Supreme Court, it's like, well, you know, this is, you know, then, then this is the end of the world. And and, and if the Supreme Court isn't in liberal hands, that's a mistake. I think it both reflects sort of an inappropriate pressure, but also a weird kind of admission of of weakness, right? Like you, you know, I don't know. So uh, one question is a little bit uh, a little bit in a, in a totally different direction again, but uh, you talk about constitutional uh, crises, and you think back to 1968 and the the uh, riots around the uh, the Democrat convention. What if the conventions, I mean, how do you handle a convention that's done via what we're doing right here, uh, but with thousands, uh, and I get a thunderstorm through and get dropped off and, and uh, you know, somebody up the street starts rolling a lot of Netflix and, uh, and, and online gaming and, and, I get, and, uh, and meanwhile, you've got uh, uh, a, a convention that, that perhaps uh, a large percentage of the attendees don't want the candidate, and, and obviously this is the Democrat side, don't want the candidate that's being selected. Uh, what, how, how does that play out? I mean, it's the, could, could we have a 1968 revisited? I mean, I, I think based on, based on what we're seeing in the country now, you're much more likely to see massive protests at any kind of Republican well, convention. Um, I don't know about Nancy. You see the, a more more protests at a Republican convention than Democrats? Yeah, yeah, and the Democratic. I feel like the Bernie Sanders moment has given way completely, and yeah. liberalism is entire. You know, liberalism and the left are, for now at least, reunited. I also think, and I, you know, I'm curious what Gary, as a scourge of parties, thinks of this. But it, I mean. Conventions are, are like irrelevant mostly now, right? Like they're relics of the days when parties sort of were actual, you know, institutions that had elites picking nominees. And that's not the system that we have anymore. So in a certain way, you could have conventions on Zoom and nobody would, you know, notice the difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I think the, the person that would notice the difference is Donald Trump. Yes. Yes. It is not. They're not going ahead with North Carolina. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. He lives for the rally. He lives. He feeds off that audience. This is this is his. Yeah, he, that, this is not going to happen on Zoom uh, for the Republican Party. Um, somehow he will find some state or foreign location to, to have a uh, to have everybody in a massive, massive room. I think that'll happen. And I think Ross is right. My guess is the divisions are such in the country that, uh, you know, that the other side hates Trump so much that they will come out and they will they will protest there. But nobody really cares about Joe Biden or not cares about Joe Biden and, and Bernie Sanders. They're not going to protest that. Um, they're going to protest, uh, protest the Republican convention. But something I, I never thought of until Charlie, till you just said this. If we are on Zoom or doing something like this, I mean, I don't know how vulnerable these places are. You're on bigmarker.com, it looks like right now, uh, to foreign interference. Uh, you know, could the foreign government uh, disrupt, uh, disrupt the proceedings, whatever those proceedings look like? Or, or foreign actors or just, uh, you know, just bad actors in our country. I don't know. I never thought of that before, but I thought that that, that could be a problem. We better not use TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think Donald Trump is going to have an in-person convention or traditional convention. Uh, the if, if you can uh, have millions of people marching in the streets uh, uh, because of uh, uh, because of these uh, this police brutality, uh, then uh, I think COVID's over. <laughs> <laughs> social distancing is done uh you know uh, all these people who you know were told oh you're you're you want to kill people to start your business and all of a sudden well now now you can march because well because you know racism is more important uh you know they they're, they're i think we're going to have conventions i think i think this whole the whole social distance the, the one thing that the uh the riots have done is uh has put an end to the whole social distancing debate as, as we come uh, to the to the end of our, our time here, let me ask you sort of one one question about the the, the you know the, the overall uh, topic, the constitutional crisis. Uh, if you could identify uh, one thing that you view as the most important thing that we should do as a country to avoid, you know, a, a significant uh, constitutional crisis, uh, what would that be? Well, let me jump in right away because I haven't talked about the Electoral College, Charlie. I don't know there why I'm here. I, I uh, made it up for you, Gary. <laughs> wasting our time. <laughs> National popular vote movement. Um, you know, if we're going to amend the Constitution, we're, if we're going to abolish the Electoral College, then let's do it. Let's have a national debate. Let's talk about all the implications of it. Um, and, uh, and let's have that fight. Let's do it. The National Popular Vote Movement, and there is a group of conservatives, supposedly now. Uh, Michael Steele, I think, is ahead of it, maybe. But uh, he's part of it, at least, um, are now advocating this state by state national popular vote movement. Uh, I'm totally against amending the Constitution by sort of going around uh, Article five of the Constitution. So let's have the let's have that debate uh, and let's let's fight it out. But another topic we didn't talk about and just throw it out is war powers. I'm I'm a big proponent of the, I think of the original vision of the presidency. The current presidency is not that. The idea that presidents can start wars around the around the world, can assassinate people around the world at their own discretion, is so far off the mark of anything our founders would have possibly uh, agreed to that it has to be revisited. Uh, we need a new War Powers Act with a little bit of teeth uh, and some flexibility. Oh, I wish you had started that conversation earlier. We have more time. <laughs> I should have waited you guys even get the last word, Mark. Of assassinations and uh, targeted killings and uh, and all the rest of it. Um, it I, I think that if anything, the from a from a constitutional perspective, the uh, the electoral college is more important now than ever as the country becomes more divided. Because the uh, the uh, the reality is is that you know the popul if you want to get if you want to put a pour gasoline on populism, try and get rid of the electoral college. Because you'll have you, what you will have is no the 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 uh, can, the Democrats will campaign in California, New York, and nowhere else, um, and they will through the through the the strength of their population try and impose uh, laws on the rest of the country and Middle America and what they consider flyover country, um, and Middle America will rebel. Uh, I think that it, you know not it, the the wisdom of having an electoral college and making sure that you couldn't ignore states. Uh, simply because of uh, their their remoteness or population has never been more uh, more obvious than it is today. Um, 
I, I don't I don't have one neat trick for avoiding a constitutional crisis. So I will <laughs> close by not disagreeing with with Gary and Mark, but suggesting that the Electoral College has functioned as well as it has for so long because it generally tracks the popular vote. Um, and it's not a bad thing to occasionally have a national outcome that doesn't track the popular vote. But I think that if you, I think that compounded over time, if you had, say, three consecutive presidential elections where you had a big gulf between the two, it would create a big, it would create a big problem for the country. And so I think admirers of the Electoral College, and I count myself as one, should want, well, but since we're all conservatives, we should want conservatives to try to win the popular vote because no, no it, doubt. it's very it's very hard. I mean, I think the, the virtue of the Electoral College is that it encourages adaptation and it discourages people from building like one percent majorities, basically. Right. But I think the next Republican politician who's leading the party, it's not going to be Trump, should want 52 percent of the vote nationwide. They should want the landslides. And so maybe that's the answer. We need politicians of both parties trying to win landslides once again. Hmm. Well, that's, uh, I think that's a great, uh, great way to end it. Um, so uh, I want to thank you. Uh, we've, uh, you know, again, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Ross, Mark and Gary for uh, uh, the spirited conversation and, and dealing with some weather issues and some other technical glitches. But uh, uh, from from uh, not having on the air conditioning to uh, to gosh knows what, but um, I think we've we've all learned a lot uh, over the last months and even tonight uh, specifically on the the impact of the pandemic on the presidency, these riots on the presidency, uh, the 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 uh, undermining of our political institutions, the impact of political parties, uh, uh, and we look forward to continued work from all of you on on these topics. I'd like to again thank all of our supporters who joined us. In many ways, you were witness tonight to a slice of what the ISI educational experience is for our students. And you got to hear references to some of our students who've gone on to do extraordinary things, including these three gentlemen here this evening. Uh, it is never lost on me that since our founding in 1953, ISI has been sustained entirely through private donations, with most of them coming from individuals like you. I can't thank you enough. And I know that if the traditions and values that undergird America's principles of liberty are to survive, not only this pandemic, but into perpetuity, uh, it will be in no small part because of your generosity, your friendship, and your support of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. So thank you all very much. Uh, and everyone, please have a, have a great night and, uh, and a healthy tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks, everybody. Great talk. Good night.